I'm going to talk about the SharePoint Framework 112 one. Uh, I'll do two quick demos uh, related on that one. We'll certainly have more demos as we GA 112 one, um, but I'll show some uh, information on it, which probably haven't seen yet. So first of all, I, I do want to always show the overall bigger picture. Uh, so SharePoint Framework is really intended right now. Uh, it's it's extending, so it's intended to be ex ex uh, the extensibility platform for. Microsoft to Viva, Microsoft Teams, and SharePoint. And of course, it's most likely being used in a SharePoint, but it's actually highly convenient for Microsoft Teams as well, and, and Viva as we're surfacing SharePoint inside of the, the Microsoft Teams. Um, the, really, the, the power is, is the fact that you don't need to set up the Azure applications. Everything is auto-hosted and optimized for hosting, especially if you only have a UX uh, capabilities or you're hitting graph APIs. So it's a really convenient scenario. Right now, we are hitting tens of millions of monthly active users uh, who are using SharePoint Framework, third-party SharePoint Framework components in Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. So it's a really, really widely uh, adapted and being used. And tens of millions third-party components means components being built by customers or partners. Uh, so not first-party components, which are provided by Microsoft. And why are we keep on pushing on this one? Uh, because, well, we're clearly seeing with the success, and we're also seeing that there's a huge opportunity for using SharePoint Framework inside of the Microsoft Teams. So as part of the 1.12.1, uh, Teams is a, one of the key focus areas as well. I will show one simple pack, packaging demo around that one uh, as within the following slides as well. But really the, the power of SPFX within the Teams is that you don't need to set up that Azure application. You don't need to worry about app, uh, app registrations, permissions, scopes, any of that one. Everything is basically automatically taken care of. So you can just synchronize your solution to Microsoft uh, Teams app catalog and voila, it works because it's all the hosted by SharePoint. And this is a model which we used also quite heavily and uh, with inside of Microsoft. So SharePoint being kind of a transforming to be not only the backend on the, for Microsoft Teams, but also the content and backend for Microsoft Teams. So kind of a hosting mechanisms in this case. So really, really cool stuff. And there's a lot of new scenarios which are coming related on, on Viva Connections. So whatever has been released right now with Viva Connections, just uh, just a scratch uh, on on uh, on all of the things which are in the pipeline. So I can't share too much on that one, but within a few weeks, there's Microsoft Build, uh, and Jeff Deeper is going to show some of those stuff which are in the plan. Now, on the 1.12.1 uh, release details, uh, so we are updating the Note uh, version to 14, which is super important. So we are finally catching up on the latest LTS version of Note. Uh, we'll have more access on the base structure and context to avoid DOM dependence. I'll show this one in practice. It's not a mind-blowing thing, but you'll get access on something which out-of-the-box web parts are using to understand are they being rendered as a full wide or in a section or in smallest uh, pieces, which is important for web parts for sure. The support for the complex Microsoft Teams solution, I'm going to show a demo, a quick demo on that one as well. So how does it actually work in practice? But this is really for the fact that if you, as an example, want to build a Microsoft Teams meeting application, which is now possible with 1.12.1 with SharePoint Framework, you will need to set additional settings in the Microsoft Teams manifest so that the Microsoft Teams will understand that, oh, this component is intended to be used as a Microsoft Teams meeting application. And in those scenarios, you'll simply embed the SIP file or the manifest file or the Microsoft Teams uh, solution structure or the Microsoft Teams solution manifest file inside of the SPP KG file. And I'll show that one in practice, how it's actually being created and, and packaged and how, how SharePoint handles that as we're synchronizing things. So technical nuances. Uh, initial support from the Teams meeting application, there's Unfortunately, small delays on the Microsoft Teams side on the on getting some of the server size changes out. So we're still bending on some some areas on there. And uh, there was a good demo on that one. However, two weeks ago, uh, and the recording is already available by Nandeep, uh, who showed how to do SharePoint framework driven Microsoft Teams application. So I'm not going to show that today. Uh, right now, we're going to support Microsoft Teams SDK 1.8. 1.9 is in the roadmap, so it's going to be supported in 1.13 of SharePoint framework, but not yet. Uh, again, technical dependence is here and there, which are delaying things. Uh, something which is new on this list is also the list and library subscription uh, general availability. So previously, our, you were able to associate your web part to be, uh, let's say, sub subscribed to events from document libraries in SharePoint sites. But now you can actually do that for lists as well. So you're basically able to say whenever a new item 
is uh, added on the list or a library or whenever there's a property change or an item modification in a list, your web part will get notified. So you're basically then able to refresh the web part UX uh, automatically when there's new items being added on the list. So as an example, just a random scenario, you have like something like Power Automate uh, pumping in your business data from uh, Azure or in a safe way uh, to a list, just the relevant data, just, just that data which you want to expose. And then you have a uh, SharePoint framework web part which is exposing some business uh, related data. So really cool scenario as well. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, small uh, improvements, uh, whatever was reported in 112 will be also going to be fixed. And then as an example, in the, the new Yeoman generator, we're going to show the version number of the SPFX, which are running as a simple thing. But as an example, Chris Kent has been requesting that feature for a long, long, long time. So that's now actually there. So that's Chris, at least is for you. All right. Woo. Now let's actually do a few demos on this. Uh, like I said, we don't have a massive amount of time, but I'll, sh I'll show the, the two scenarios uh, in a more detailed way. So more access on the base structure and context to avoid DOM dependency. Now, not a rocket science thing, uh, but what it actually means uh, is that let me actually add here a really simple web part, just focusing on the scenario and, and technical thing, what we're doing here. And the web part name is something like white tester. There we go. Uh, and basic idea is here is that your web part will know what is the wide where it's being rendered. So we'll expose the new uh, property for in the web part base class which will actually expose the wide of the web part spacing. And what it means is that whenever I'm changing, for example, let's actually do that. Whenever I'm changing the section to be smaller, uh, the wide um, uh, is being adjusted and, and the web part will know and will be notified that, hey, now you're being rendered in a smaller space. If you have a different rendering output when you are in less than 400 pixels, uh, you can take advantage of that. Previously, this kind of a functionality required that you are detecting the DOM structure and then analyzing am I in a what kind of a section, how many columns there is in the section, and then you adjust your rendering. So as an example, the out-of-the-box hero web part and the newest web parts are using this to change their rendering logics, logistics uh, from being multiple, uh, well, I think the smallest one is that every single image is being rendered one by one and then being transferred one step at a time. So it's, it's a good example of an out-of-the-box web part, which is actually taking advantage of this. And how this actually works, uh, again, simple thing, but I think it's a good add-on. Um, and it's just fair that you will get access on the same things as what out-of-the-box web parts have. And this is really nothing more than, uh, let me actually get rid of that. Uh, there is a new white property, uh, which is in the base class of the of the web part, which will give you uh, the white in pixels. And then you are basically able also to subscribe on an after, after resize event. And this is basically for catching the resizing happening on a page so that you're able to re-render uh, whatever you're rendering. Uh, and changing the rendering logic. In this case, this is a super, super simple example, just focusing on the change in here. But good to see Charles Rodriguez is, is already super excited on the on this one, but absolutely a useful thing. Um, and like I said, out of the box web parts has been taking advantage of this one as well. So it's good to be available for you as well. Now, the second thing uh, is that we're gonna change slightly uh, the packaging uh, structure and packaging model uh, within the SharePoint framework solution. This is not gonna break obviously anything which is already there, but this is an additional option. And what we're going to do is that by default, SharePoint Framework, when you sync your solution to the Teams, by default, what happens is that SharePoint Framework basically reads uh, the configure package solution information. It's going to use uh, this information, for example, in the developer section for the name and website URL, privacy URL, and terms of use, and NPM ID, and a few additional settings. But if we have a look on a really complex manifest, or this is not super complex manifest, but a, a manifest uh, can be super complex. It can have a dependency on bot. It can define a task module. It can define multiple other things. There are additional settings and options all the time being introduced as part of this uh, manifest. So rather than us in SharePoint engineering, trying to keep up with all of the latest things, for example, what's in the supported in manifest version 1.9, we kind of sort of start supporting embedding the whole zip file as part of the solution. And this will work in a way that uh, in the Teams folder, 
uh, you will need to have a specifically named zip file and slightly awkward, but again, it makes sense because internal code and server side is then just detecting that zip file inside of the SAPKJ file. So what I have here is that I, I'm actually going to show this one in practice. Let's open it in here. Uh, so this is manually created zip file, which have been created by adding my, my image, my uh, manifest, which I created manually, and the two of the images, and then basically just created a zip file in here. Of course, you can use uh, App Studio in, in Teams or whatever tooling you prefer to create the manifest file and then export that from there. But then I need to have the zip file uh, named as Teams SPFX app dot zip. And that's basically then a detection for SharePoint that, oh, this is that kind of a zip file, which is intended to be the one which was synchronizing the teams. So, um, so when we are then packaging the solution, let me actually do that quickly. Uh, so here, uh, when we do call up uh, package uh, solution, I think I actually have a one version package already, but that's fine. Uh, SharePoint engine and the packaging tooling will actually detect that, uh, that zip file, and it will actually contain or add that one included in the package. So you can, we can see that if we extend the SharePoint folder in here and the debug folder, which actually contains what's inside of this SPPKG file, in the client-side assets, we have the Teams SPFX app zip file available. And then this means that whenever I'm actually installing the package manifest solution inside of the app catalog and synchronize, we actually take that manifest which is included in the SPPKG file. And then we use that one. Yeah, where's my browser? There we go. We use that one then to actually uh, synchronize or add and install that to the Teams uh, app catalog. So in, like in this case, I've just created an example, which is just using the, I synchronized this while back uh, or for testing, but I'm able to modify all of this stuff directly in the JSON file or creating the whole manifest in the manifest uh, in the App Studio and then synchronize that in. So, and that gives the flexibility. It can have a dependency of whatever, it can have an association to bot, it can do additional other settings, whatever the manifest uh, is supporting. We support that as part of the SPFX solutions as well, and also including store deployments. So if you're looking into getting a solution to the store, that works as well. But now uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so that's a really quick demo on two of those things. I just wanna make sure that everybody understands what they are.